prayer. Father God, uh, that last song Josh sang, Led Us and Cindy, uh, we're not capable of doing what those words said. We want to be your hands and feet. We want to go to the darkest places. We want to be the love of Jesus, but we're not capable of it. But you are. And we thank you that by your indwelling Holy Spirit, you already have the desire, the will, and all the ability to do those things. And so today, Father, may today be a day when we just receive your word to be your hands and feet, to be the love of Jesus. And we pray it, Father, in his name. Amen. Amen. Well, did you get what you wanted for Christmas? Uh, you know, it's a question a lot of people got asked during the week this week. What did you get for Christmas? Uh, did you get what you want? It got asked at work. Uh, us guys yesterday morning at our men's life group, a uh, few of us who were early, we were sort of sharing with each other what kind of gifts we received as Christmas gifts and those kinds of things. It's a common topic uh, this time of year. We get all kinds of grit, you know, gifts at Christmas, and we get them from people that we thought were our friends <laughs> or loved ones. Until we open the gift, and it makes you wonder. You know, uh, I mean, I'm not just talking about some of those weird neckties uh, that us guys can get at Christmas. Uh, and I'm about to tell you a series of real people's experiences that have been told to me over the years. Uh, like, for example, those wonderful men's soap on a rope and cologne sets that uh, so many men received. One guy said uh, that they must be extremely valuable because his father has stored many of them in the closet for decades while they increase in value. Uh, uh, or the, uh, the guy who gave that romantic gift of a leaf blower to his wife. The kind of thing us, that us guys are notorious for giving to our wives and girlfriends. Ladies, if you are a wife or you have a boyfriend and it hasn't happened to you sooner or later, believe me, it's probably going to happen. And I guess the one story that stands out in my mind more than any is one that a guy told about how he was 10 years old and it comes time for his mother to open the big gift from his father. The one that everybody knew was some kind of special romantic gift from his father to his mother. Something that was going to be really meaningful. And she opens up the box and it's that very special, very romantic electric blanket. <laughs> Here's the part that, that, that has never has always stuck with me. He said, the look on his mother's face, when he remembers the look his mother gave his father, when she saw what he had given her for Christmas, he said to this day, when he remembers the look on his mother's face, it was so scary, it still sends shivers down his spine. <laughs> Or the guy, this, this happened uh, at a church I was pastoring down in North Carolina where the guy gave his wife her one and only gift for Christmas, a chainsaw. And he, when he was at, why? He said, well, I just thought we needed a chainsaw. You know, that was his answer. Now, I want you to forgive me for being so humor impaired. I once pastored in a church where in order for people to laugh at my jokes, Shuri had to make a sign that said it was a joke you can laugh at. And she, she put it on a big poster and had it on uh, tape to a yardstick. And I would tell the joke, and then it would just look at me. 
<laughs> and then she would raise a sign and do it. So forgive me for what I'm about to tell you. When it comes to gift giving and the Bible, probably the part of the story that we can relate to the most is the story of the Magi, the three wise men. And the reason for that is that these three guys are most likely the only people in the nativity story that were most likely Gentiles. Now, some scholars think that there, there's quite possibly at least one of these guys who was, and the reason they're Gentiles is because they came from another land. And we don't know for sure, but some researchers think that probably at least one of these guys was quite possibly not just a Gentile, but based on the research, was a Southerner. Mm -hmm. Now, we know the reason for this is because in the case of one of these guys, it was said that he brought into the country from his home the gift of myrrh, which everybody knows is the ancient Mesopotamian word for fried chicken. <laughs> uh, and I mean, since this guy, you know, he was following the star, he was probably planning on stopping off at Walmart and getting a nice gift, and his wife said, here, I just cooked this. They're probably going to need it and be hungry. Take this to them. So if he was from the south, and that's what he took them. It was not only fried chicken, it was southern fried chicken. And it's possible that they were all volunteer firemen, maybe from the south, because when they were asked where they had come from, one of them said, we came from a fire. <laughs> Enough of the jokes. Well, getting back to the kinds of gifts you got for Christmas. I'll make the, any joke you tell the future look really good. <laughs> you know, not everyone gets what they want or what they wish for when they want it. I'm thinking of a guy whose cardiologist sent him to meet with me and talk with me. Uh, his name was Ed. He was suffering from a lot of stress that was causing heart problems. Ed grew up in a small town in Southern Virginia. I won't name the town because if I did, those of you who've lived around here long enough would recognize the name of the town. He grew up being taken to church, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, traditional church, until he got into his mid to late teens and it meant nothing to him and he refused to go anymore. So we quit going. But Ed had a dream. And he grew up to fulfill his dream. He grew up to be a millionaire financial planner. Unfortunately, he made a lot of his millions by not being completely honest with his financial planning clients. And you know, uh, about, uh, what was it, 10 years or so ago, when the, fin when the economy crashed, the stock market uh, crashed, finances went down and everything, uh, People started calling Ed wanting their money in their account that he was managing for them. Uh, they wouldn't stop calling his office wanting to get their money. And he was afraid to take their calls. He was afraid to return their calls, asking where their money was. Ed and I talked several times about what was going on in his life and the stress that was causing damage to his heart. And knowing that he had grown up going to church, I asked him, where were things in his relationship with the Lord? And here was Ed's response. Ed said, unless the Lord can get him the money that he lost and all the money that he owed people that he had taken from them that they didn't know about, then they were not in their accounts and they thought they were, and he didn't care about having a relationship with God. All Ed wanted was his money. He didn't care that the stress was causing him health problems and damaging his heart. All Ed wanted was his money. He didn't care that he did not have assurance of life in heaven instead of hell. All Ed wanted was his money. Well, as you know, the economy did not improve for several years. And I don't know what eventually happened to Ed, but I know Ed never did get what he wanted. Sometimes we don't get the gift we want. 1 Peter 3.12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, 
and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those or turned away from those who do evil. Now, even when we do good, that's no guarantee that we're going to get what we want. I'm thinking of someone who told me about when she was a little girl at the age of 10. She was always a good girl. She did extra chores. She always made not just good grades in school, but almost straight A's. She was always well behaved. Her brothers and sisters, on the other hand, could care less. They didn't do their homework. They made bad grades. They were disobedient to their parents. They, uh, they would not do their chores. She was often made to do her disobedient brothers and sisters' chores. So Christmas morning comes, and this very good 10-year-old girl goes to open her gift. Notice I said the word gift, which included one pair of jeans and one blouse. While her disobedient brothers and sisters opened more gifts, more toys, better than anything that they could have ever expected, and if what they got was based on their, if, if what your children are supposed to get uh, from under the tree on Christmas morning is supposed to be based on their behavior, uh, they got everything that they didn't deserve, and she got nothing that she did deserve. Now, you're thinking there, maybe this doesn't even happen in real life. You know, maybe this is only the kind of thing that happens to Cinderella and people in fairy tales, that kind of thing. But let me tell you, that girl, now a woman in her 40s, a wife and mother, who lives not all that far from here, told me not that long ago about that childhood experience. The truth is, sometimes life in this world is unfair. Sometimes people, even your own relatives, can be selfish and uncaring. Sometimes we just don't get what we ask for. Carrie didn't get what she asked for. All her life since she was a little girl, she had a typical little girl type dream, and she did all the things she was supposed to do to achieve that dream. And she worked hard at it. And she was a good girl. And she had a deep abiding relationship with Jesus Christ. But when he came right to the edge of getting what she wanted, when she came right to the highest pinnacle of success, she was denied the thing she wanted most. You see, she put her relationship with God ahead of her own personal desire that she had had as a little girl. Because she realized that her little girl wishes were nothing compared to the will of God. When she asked God for the thing that she as a little girl had always wanted most in life, he said no. Instead, God said, I've got something more important for you than what you want. <clears throat> God told her it will mean giving up what you wanted since you were a little girl for what I have that will mean more to you eternally. You know, Romans 14, 17 tells us that the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy within us in the Holy Spirit. So Carrie Prejean didn't get what she wanted. Instead, she got something better. She was given an opportunity to stand in front of an international television audience and stand up for the kingdom of God on international television in front of the entire world as a finalist in the Miss USA pageant. Something that as a little girl, a typical little girl dream, you know, that kind of thing. Because she knew that when the judges took turns asking that one final question to the finalist, that the person who had been picked to ask her question was a well-known LGBT public relations publicist who knew that she was a student at an evangelical Christian college. And his question for her was, did she support same-sex marriage? In that moment, Carrie Prejean gave up her lifelong dream of wearing the Miss USA crown. 
Instead, she exchanged it for a crown that she will one day cast at the feet of the Savior in heaven. 22-year-old Carrie told Fox News, and I quote, she said, this happened for a reason. By having to answer that question in front of a national audience, God was testing my character and faith. Sounds sort of like Esther from the Old Testament, doesn't it? But she said, I'm glad I stayed true to my beliefs. Affirmation from others is encouraging, but feeling deeply loved and chosen by God is far greater. Ephesians 1, 4 says, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. Did you, did you know that? Before God even created the world, before you were ever even created, he already knew you and he already loved you. The Bible often refers to God's decision to love unconditionally as God's electing or calling or choosing you. All of us have experienced in one form or another and carry the scars in our hearts of rejection. You undoubtedly remember those painful times in your life. Maybe you were made fun of at school by the more popular kids. Maybe you were always the one chosen last for the team. Maybe you remember receiving and still receive hurtful words from a parent or a grandparent or loved one. Maybe you remember having a friend or a spouse walk out on your life. You may have spent years trying to earn the approval of someone who seems unpleasable. Understand this. If you haven't gotten that person's approval by now, it isn't likely you're going to ever get it. But the good news is that you don't, have, you don't need any human approval to be filled with the peace and the joy of God by His Holy Spirit in you in order to be set free from living for the approval of others you need to refocus on how much you matter to god and his unconditional love for you god wants you to receive deep within your being the love that he has for you he wants you to truly receive deep within your being your worth and your value that he has placed in you when you trusted in Jesus Christ. Listen to what the Bible says in Romans 8. What can we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. And I love what it says in Psalm 27. Even if my father and mother abandon me, the Lord will hold me close. You know, that's what the cross stands for. Maybe you've tried to change yourself and correct some of your old ways. But with each cycle of best intentions and failures and remorse, you feel more and more trapped and hopeless. You need a power greater than yourself. You need a Savior. Jesus said in John 8, If the Son sets you free, then you are free indeed. Amen? Amen? That's something to celebrate. God never intended for you to go through life on your own power. He wants you to trust Him and depend on Him. He's been waiting for you to stop trying and start trusting. The, you know, the acid test of what you believe it's not how happy you are and what you believe at happy celebrations like weddings and births and graduations. You know, you can get away with believing pretty much anything when life is going great. But when the emotional storms of life beat down your dreams, when relational earthquakes rip apart your relationships, when financial fires turn your assets to ashes, when physical pain pummels your body, and when the eventual deaths of loved ones leave you lonely and lost, what will uphold and empower you then? It's foolish to live in denial, unprepared 
for what everyone knows is inevitable. If you have accepted what Jesus did for you on the cross, your eternal destiny is already secured, and you no longer need to fear. As we were singing that song that Josh led, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I looked around the room, and the rest of that song, some of you could sing. But when it came to that line, some of you could not sing it. I'm no longer a slave to fear. Your lips didn't move on that line. You no longer need to fear. You no longer need to fear loss. You no longer need to fear rejection. You never again fear abandonment or loneliness. You'll never have to fear death. The Bible says in Hebrews 2, since we, God's children, are human beings made of flesh and blood. He, Jesus, became flesh and blood too by being born in human form. For only as a human being could he die and in dying break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in that way could he deliver those who through fear of death have been living all their lives as slaves to constant dread. Wow. At some point in life, each of us struggles with these three basic life questions. You may want to write them down and think about them. The first is the question of existence. Why am I alive? The second is the question of significance. Does my life matter? And the third is the question of intention. What is my purpose? You can be certain that God has always had a purpose for your being. That's what I was talking about when I referenced earlier Ephesians 1.4 when it says long before he laid down the earth's foundations, God had us in mind and he had settled on us as the focus of his love. But you know, we've all made many detours in life thinking we knew better. So God had to send Jesus as our Savior to redeem us from sin to reset the directions for our lives, and to restore us to his original purposes that he had when he created us for our lives. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us we're not saved from evil, we're saved for good. And how so? Because Jesus died for all so that all who live, that is all of us, having received eternal life from him, might live no longer for themselves to please themselves, but to spend their lives with the joy, with the privilege of pleasing God who died and rose again for them. God creates you. God shapes you. God gifts you. God calls you. And God saved you for a purpose. That's why Romans 6.13 says, Give yourselves completely to God, every part of you. For you are back from the dead, and you want to be tools in the hands of God to be used for His good purposes. You know, when you finally begin fulfilling the purpose that God created you for, as Josh was lead us, leading us in singing about being the hands and feet, of Jesus. You can you then realize this is it. This is why I'm alive. This is my reason for being. Now I know why I exist. You know there's nothing under a Christmas tree no matter how big and beautiful that tree, no matter how many beautiful gifts are wrapped under that tree for for you. All the success in the world will never fill that hole in your heart and give you the deep satisfaction that comes from knowing, from loving, from trusting, and serving through a Holy Spirit-filled life. So let me ask you some pointed questions. Knowing that nothing else you've tried has completely satisfied that longing in your soul, what are you waiting for? Isn't it time for all of us to examine ourselves and ask ourselves if we're truly allowing God 
to do in and through us what we were singing about earlier, something more than warming a seat here on Sunday mornings after we eat and sing. The Bible says, prove your faith by your works. If you were put on trial, you probably heard this question before, but I'm going to repeat it. If you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you by your actively serving God through this spiritual church family and in your daily life? If not, then why not let this be the Christmas season? Why not let this upcoming year be the time when you say it's now or never? Today is the day I step up. Today is the day I start putting my faith on the line and dedicate myself to serving God in whatever way he desires to work through me by the Holy Spirit. We don't do this to earn God's approval. We don't do this to deserve God's love. We don't do it to continue to try to somehow earn our way into heaven as though somehow trusting in Jesus was not enough by doing good and trying to be perfect. No, we do it because Jesus said, get this, Jesus said, the work God wants to do in and through us is our proof that we believe in the one he sent. Do you believe? Can you prove it by what you're doing in your service to him? Now, we're not talking about being religious. Religion is man's attempt to please God. Grace is God's reaching down to mankind. So God came down to earth as Jesus essentially to say, of course doing good matters, but it, is, it doesn't make me, God, love you more or love you less. My love for you is unlimited my love for you is unconditional. My love for you is unchanging and undeserved. So he says, let me teach you a new concept of living moment by moment, day by day, called grace. You can't purchase it. You can't work for it. You can't pray hard enough for it. You can't do enough to be good enough to merit it. Jesus said it's a gift. <clears throat> that cost him everything, but it's free to you and me. Every, he says, everything I do for you, everything I do to you, in you, and through you, every single blessing in your life is a gift of my grace. I did it all for you. You know, when you think back on that manger that was there 2,100 years ago in a stable, if somebody asks you, what must I do to get to heaven? The answer is, you're too late. It's already been done. What needed to be done was done for you 2,100 years ago by God who left the glory of heaven, put on human skin, and as a baby named Jesus was laid in a manger for one purpose. And that purpose was to grow up to give his life as a ransom for the sins of you and me and all mankind. What you need to do is accept what he's already done for you. If somebody asks you that question, there's your answer. Accept what Jesus has already done for you. There's nothing more to add. That's what grace is all about. That's why Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says... It is by grace you have been saved through faith. That is, not from yourselves, it's a free gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Now, as you look at this verse, I want you to notice that your Christmas gift from God comes by grace and through faith. So what is grace? Grace is God's love in action. Grace is when God freely gives you what you need, even though you don't deserve it and you can never repay it. Grace is when God has already solved your greatest problem, that of sin, even before you knew you had the problem. 
You know why the tradition of gift giving began with Christmas? It's because God gave the first and greatest gift at the very first Christmas, the gift of his son. That's why I love 2 Corinthians 9.15. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Maybe there's something you've been looking for in your own life, but you just haven't found it. Maybe what you've been trying to do is try to please God and deserve your salvation by your own efforts. Maybe you've had times in your life when your priorities came from yourself and not from God. So you have thoughts like this, well, if I could just find the right man or the right woman, everything would be great. If I had a certain job or I got a promotion or I had a baby or I attained a certain level of wealth, then I'd feel peaceful and fulfilled. If I could only achieve a beautiful body, if I could only impress the right people, if I could own the right possessions, or maybe just escape to Tahiti, then my emptiness would be fulfilled. But the answer is not in a place, it's not in a program, it's not a title, a husband, or a wife, or a pile of money. The answer is Jesus. When, when you're, what you're missing is allowing yourself to fully receive and embrace that daily intimate relationship with the one who created you so he could love you. That's why it says in 2 Peter 1.3, For as you know him better, he will give you through his great power everything you need for living a truly good life. He even shares his own glory and his own goodness with us. He takes his glory and his goodness and he puts it in you. And he wants you to luxuriate in that. He wants you to be filled with the knowledge of that. He wants you to receive it and feel it and know that it's true because it came from what Christ did. So, Matthew 7, 7 says, Ask and it will be given you. And in Mark eleven twenty four, 24, Jesus says, Whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. So it's Christmas morning, this past Tuesday morning, about 4.40 a.m. I know because I looked at the clock. And I began to pray for my spiritual family. And I began to name each and every one of you who were here and those who are part of this spiritual family who are not here this morning. And I prayed for you specifically by name. And for those of you who were here two weeks ago and you shared with me some specific spiritual need or struggle, or the name of a loved one that you shared with me, I want you to know I prayed for those needs and for those loved ones. And throughout the day, I literally prayed for each and every member by name of this spiritual family. And I began to pray that we would allow God to guide us, that we would allow God to prepare us, that we would allow God to equip us, that we, his spiritual family, who gathers here together to worship him, that we would allow him to make us a true light set high up on a hill, that to all those around us, all those who are in our lives, that we would be the vessels through whom God draws them to himself. That he draws those who are hurting because of the evil and spiritual sickness of this world. That we would see with spiritual eyes those who are lonely and in need of an authentic relationship. As Shuri and I were traveling last week, we stopped for a meal. And as the waitress took our order... We shared with her that after she took our order, we were going to stop and we were going to pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And we were going to ask him for his blessings on our food and on our lives. And was there something going on in her life 
that she needed us to pray about for her. Her name, well, I guess I shouldn't say her name. Her name. But she started to fight back tears as she shared with us how she had just gone through a divorce. And she was struggling to figure out how what she was going to do with her life, finding a place to live and get back on her feet. And then later, after we prayed for her, there was a note that said, I have been needing someone to pray for me. God bless you for praying for me. I have been praying that we, this spiritual family, would intentionally reach out with our hands and feet, go to the places of darkness with understanding and compassion to those who have given up, to those who are in brokenness and they've turned to addictive behaviors or anything to escape their pain. You know, nine out of ten people, this is a research fact. Nine out of ten people you meet outside these doors are missing what only Jesus can provide. And he desires to use us as the vessels through whom he makes that offer. That's why Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, they will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Brothers and sisters, most of the people we meet outside these doors are missing the one thing we all need most to know and receive the God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. What better gift can you receive than to have the deep and abiding hunger and thirst to share this gift from God that we received with every person God brings into your life to provide you with the opportunity and the privilege to share through you the love and the good news of Jesus Christ, to share it with them. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you and praise you for this indescribable gift that you gave us when Jesus took our sins and bore them on the cross. And then... When he said to go out and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that he wasn't sending us out alone. He wasn't sending us out in our own power. Lord Jesus, just as you had the, the apostles, the very first ones, wait for the Holy Spirit to come, now, because we have trusted in you, your Holy Spirit dwells in us. And all the power and all the desire to use and work through us to display who you are dwells within us. Show us whatever we need to know about ourselves. Anything that might be standing in the way of allowing you to be all you are and display all you are, your love, to a dark and broken world, to every person we meet. And I ask that on behalf of my brothers and sisters I love here in this place. By the power of your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Now we're about to have our little discussion time that we've been having at the end of each service. And I have a handout for you. Basically, it's pretty simple today. It's one thing to discuss. An opportunity for you to, sh uh, for you to share someone who is in your life or that you know, maybe a co-worker or a loved one that you know has a spiritual need, that they do not know Jesus as Savior or there's something, a spiritual need in their relationship with the Lord, for you to share that person's name so that the other people at your table can pray for that person with you. 
And then we're going to have a homework assignment for this week. Woo. Now, you know how Daniel normally has been taking track. He didn't do it today because that was his Christmas present. <laughs> but normally he writes up here on the board, how many times in the past week did you read? Were you in God's Word? How many times in the past week did you spend time with the Lord talking and listening to Him in, in prayer with the Lord? I'm going to add one assignment. Now, it's a tough assignment. I don't know if you're up to it. I don't know if you have the ability. This is really, really tough assignment. Uh, See a smirk right there. Yeah. <laughs> It's an assignment that involves you saying five words. That's tough. <laughs> the catch is you have to say them to somebody you don't know. A co-worker, somebody in a grocery store, a restaurant, gas station. Here's the really tough five words. Hi, how are you doing? Oh my gosh. Ah, how are you doing? Now, you might not get a response. You might get a one word response. Or they may tell you their whole life story. But God is preparing us to be equipped to share the love of Jesus, to be his hands and feet to a dark world. And so the first step is for you to allow the Holy Spirit to give you the courage to say to a stranger, Hi, how are you doing? I'm actually new. And we're going to ask <laughs> next week, how many of you did your homework assignment and ask a stranger, Hi, how are you doing? So, here's what I want you to do. I want, I'd like us to have three people at each table, somebody you haven't sat with lately, and not a relative. So let's divide up into tables with three people at each table if we can. Oh, and I'm going to pass out the assignment for you to do. Not a relative. Not a relative. So if 